Well, today the feast of Epiphany and the greatest feast of the Christmas tide. Good to be here in Brisbane, in Australia. And the epistle for this <clears throat> January 6th is Feast of Epiphany, 2017. It is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. <laughs> Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and they miss the people. For the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall walk in thy light, and the kings in the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thy eyes round about and see. All these are gathered together. They are come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar. And thy daughters shall rise up at thy side. Then shalt thou see and abound, and thy heart shall wonder and be enlarged, when the multitude of the sea shall be converted to thee. The strength of the Gentiles shall come to thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, and the dromedaries of Median and Aphah. All they from Saba shall come, bringing gold and frankincense, and showing forth praise to the Lord. And then the Gospel. Take that according to St. Matthew, chapter 2. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of King Herod, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to adore him. And King Herod, hearing was, this, was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for so it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art not, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come forth the captain that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, privately calling the wise men, Learn diligently of them the time of the star which appeared to them. And sending them into Bethlehem, said, Go and diligently inquire after the child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I also may come and adore him, who having heard the king went their way. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over the where the child was. And seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And entering into the house, they found the child with Mary and his mother. And falling down, they adored him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having received an in answer in sleep, that they should not return to Herod, they went back another way into their own country. That's what the words of the Holy God. <clears throat> only the Father and the only goes to men. Today, the greatest feast of the season of Christmas, the feast of Epiphany, which means the divine manifestation where God shows Himself. And though it's the second greatest feast in the year after the feast of Easter, it is often a forgotten feast. Like this year, finds itself in the middle of the week and forgotten. But it is the most sacred feast of the Christmas season. And it is a true and sacred and holy mystery. The divine manifestation, God shows himself. The last time that God will show himself will be at the very end of the world. And there shall be a great trumpet. And there should be a blasting of the trumpet. And it says in the Gospel of St. Matthew and other places also, and all the earth shall mourn. The entire earth shall mourn because God is coming in power and majesty. <coughs> so the entire earth shall mourn. And the trumpet shall blow from the east, and then he shall come as lightning 
from the east even unto the west. So he is going to come. And he comes in great power and majesty at the last moment. He also came in great power and majesty at the first moment. Because God looked upon nothingness. And he poured his divine power into nothingness. He poured his divine goodness into nothingness. And he spoke. And he said, let there be light. And light was made. He spoke again. And each time that he spoke, the entire world was created over the course of six days in most magnificent manner. So in the beginning, he spoke with great power and showed himself in that way. In the end, he speaks with great power and he shows himself in that way. Make it very clear, the God that creates, the God that sustains, is the God that judges. And he is God every moment in between. And now we're about 6,000 years after that day of creation and only a short time before the day of judgment and we have a feast of epiphany and this feast of epiphany is not about the divine manifestation which comes at the end of the world the great power and majesty nor is it about the great divine manifestation at the very beginning but it's about the various divine manifestations that have shown themselves throughout this world in the last 6,000 years we have one of them right now and it is happening always. God shows himself. There are two infinites, says Pascal, I believe it is. Two infinites that are a mystery to man. That we cannot comprehend. The infinitely great and the infinitely small. And both are infinite. But in which one does God really show his power? Because God is greater in size than the entire universe. He is much larger than the universe. The infinitely great is close to God. The infinitely small is far from him. And wherever we show our power, when our power reaches to the farthest limits, that shows the extent of our power. And therefore, God's power is shown greater by the infinitely small than it is shown by the infinitely great. He showed his power one day when the Jews passed through the Red Sea and the wall of the water was made on both sides. And he passed with great power and majesty 600,000 men. And another one million and a half women and children, about two million, walked through that sea. And then they passed through the other side, completely on dry land. Pharaoh tried it with his cohort and with his army. And it was wiped out by the power of the sea. And this is a very small thing in the power of God. And St. Augustine says it this way. He says, what is the greater miracle? And he gives the example of the sea. What is the greater miracle? The miracle by which God stopped the sea? And the men on the ship said, Behold, the wind and the sea obey him. Or the miracle by which he makes one grain of oat, one grain of wheat, grow up to become wheat, to be edible to us. One, oak, one acorn to grow up to become a tree. Or one, one little seed to grow up to become a blade of grass. Which is the greater miracle? And he says, Clearly, to stop the sea is a small thing. To cause the waves to make Pharaoh's men drown is a small thing. But we say it's great because it happens so rarely. But in fact, the great miracle is to take a small mustard seed and make it into a tree. To make a small seed of an acorn and make it into a tree. To make a small seed and make it into a leaf. To make a small little bitty uh, baby and make it into a man. These are so much greater miracles because we see them every day, we think of them as small. And when we look at the end of the world, we will look back upon how God showed himself from the beginning of time until the very end. And we will see the magnificence of God's ways and God's presence in little things. He will go into a, a soul that hates him and a small thing will happen and that soul will repent and convert. He will go into a nation and a small thing will happen, and a nation shall be turned to him, and shall return back to God. And we have an example of this in the greatest way that God showed himself in the Old Testament, which is through Joseph. Joseph is the example of the divine manifestation. What do we say of Joseph? The word Joseph simply means, he shall increase. And how does Joseph increase? Both the great Joseph of the Old Testament and St. Joseph of the New they increase in a most mysterious way. St. Joseph is the protector of the church. And he protects God <coughs> in his church. He protects the mother of God. 
How many words does he speak? How many commands does he make? How many great battles does he fight? In our eyes, it appears as though they are zero, none. And yet somehow he wins. Somehow he brings, he saves God. Somehow he saves the whole of the church. Somehow he protects the mother of God. Somehow he brings to safety God himself being chased by his enemies. When we go back to the Old Testament, the same is true. Joseph, the Old Testament. All he did was dream. And when we think we see about God showing himself, God's ways are not our ways. That's what our Lord said. My ways are not your ways. And so how does he show his ways? He shows them in a dream. He shows his ways in a dream. Because dreams are foolishness to the world. No wise man believes in dreams. But we followers of Jesus Christ, we believe in dreams. And we know that dreams are more real than the outside world. When it is a dream that comes from God. And we see this dream show itself to the three kings. The three kings, when they first began their journey, they saw a star on the outside, and God was outside them, says St. Augustine. They were still pagans. They had not yet seen Christ. They were not yet filled with Him. They were simply called by an attraction. There was a magnet of Christ calling these Gentiles, calling these, who were, these men who were not of the true race, who are not of the kingdom of God, but they saw the star, and they were magnetically pulled to him, and they came. They wisely asked the king of Jerusalem, where is the new king going to be born? And the king was so darkened, the king was so filled with wickedness, that he did not know. And therefore Herod had to call together the priests, and the priests had so forgotten the law of God, that they had to look it up in the books. It's like asking someone today, how many, asking a priest, how many sacraments are there? Let me look it up. That means he's missing a little bit in his theology. So they had to look it up. And they said, oh yes, it says here that Bethlehem will be the place where the great leader comes from. The priest did not know. The king did not know. And this caused amazement to the three foreign kings. And then they were wondering about this great king. Surely is a great king. But his own people don't care about his coming. And we can see clearly that when we tell the people about Jerusalem, your king is coming, they're not happy. It says in the book of the Gospel of St. Matthew, reading the Gospel today, they were worried. They were disturbed. We can see in this Gospel how God shows himself. When God comes, he came on the 24th of December to Bethlehem. And they went to a house. And when they went to the house, the mother of God was carrying God himself inside of her womb. God was there, ready to be born, ready to show himself. And she said, I need a place to stay. I'm about to have a child. And she said, not even Joseph asked. And they said, I'm sorry, but we have no room. If only they had known that it was God that was going to be born. They would have set a special place, but they didn't know. And if only they were not busy... If only they were not tied up with their business, they would surely have had a place for this wonderful little mother and this young man and their little child, clearly poor and in great need. I hope someone helps them. But today is not a good day. <coughs> God showed himself. And it says in the Gospel of St. John, at the very end of the Mass, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came into his own, his own received him not. God showed himself. So what is the first sign we see about God showing himself? When God shows himself in little ways, when God shows his divine presence, the first sign is that he's unrecognized by the world. He's unrecognized by the kings. He's unrecognized by the priests. He's unrecognized by his own people. And so <coughs> and they, they don't recognize him. And so he goes on. And then our Lord, these three kings are going to find Christ. And they want to find him. They follow the star. The star disappears in the presence of King Herod. When they leave Herod's wicked presence, the star appears again. And it takes him over the child. And they give him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now when he gave the gold and frankincense and myrrh, did it cause a conversion of the neighbors? Right now Jesus Christ is going to show himself in this little hotel room. In this little conference room. He's going to show himself. 
It's going to be divinely present in a few moments of the consecration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass for all the people in Brisbane. But will the neighbors know? No, they're busy. They're busy at work. They're busy at play. They're busy trying to survive. They're busy being approved. They're busy in so many ways. But God is going to be here. He's going to show himself. And this is the way he prefers to show himself. Because it is how he showed himself in the beginning. And he will not change. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Our thoughts change all the time. His thoughts do not change. My ways are not your ways. Our ways are looking for security. His ways are to command the fulfillment of his own will. He doesn't need security. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And if we want to follow him, we, gotta, we have to enter into his thoughts. If we want to follow him, we have to go in according to his ways. And therefore, we should not be surprised that in the beginning of 2017, the vast majority of souls in the world are not interested in the divine manifestation. They're not interested in God showing Himself. In fact, many are here to stop Him. They are here to block Him. They don't want God to come. And there was a great unrest. So we notice the first thing, when God comes, He's not recognized. Secondly, when He comes, there is a great unrest. There is a great disturbance. St. Ignatius explains the disturbance quite simply. He says in rule number seven of the Ignatian Retreat, the litmus test rules of the second week, when the soul is an enemy of God, the devil comes in and out most peacefully like water dropping upon a sponge. But when the good angel comes, it is rather like water hitting a rock, and it disturbs us. When the soul is a friend of God, it's the opposite. The angel comes peacefully, and the devil causes a disturbance. And we find our world today faithfully following Satan. Faithfully following the prince of this world. And therefore, the presence of Christ is disturbing. The presence of Christ is reason for gossip. The presence of Christ must be stopped. <coughs> and there was unrest. We mentioned a few weeks ago, notice the unrest was not only of Herod, Herod, of course, is disturbed because he's a king. And there's a new king who's going to take his place. He's disturbed. Why are the people disturbed? Because they hated Herod. They despised him. They wished for his death. This is one of the most wicked kings of all time. Herod, in fact, when he died, he made a final decree because he knew that he was hated by everyone. He murdered his own mother with his own hands. He murdered 500 innocents at the birth of Christ. And murder was a daily thing for him. Killing the innocent was only one of his thousands and thousands and thousands of crimes. He was hated by everyone. And Herod's final decree before he died, he told his soldiers, his trusted soldiers, my last decree is this. He called together all the leaders of Israel to come to both around his deathbed or else he would kill them. And so they came. And he said, when you hear the word of my death, kill every one of them. Because there will be mourning on the day of the death of Herod. No one will mourn my death, but they will mourn their own. They will mourn the death of all those who shall die on the day that I die. And such was the end of the wicked king. And of course he's disturbed in the presence of the king. But why are the people disturbed? We have our present situation. A wicked Pope Francis. A bishop Valet that is turned away from God. And no longer leading us to Christ. And now, unfortunately, Bishop Williamson doing the same thing, telling us that the new Mass is good and that, that we can get grace from it, and thus by thus leading souls away from God. And what happens? They are disturbed. They are disturbed that the word of our sister the Feb is still being spoken. They are disturbed that the truth still is spoken outright as we speak it today and must continue to speak until our death. And if we stop speaking it, then let us be abandoned. But we must speak the divine truth. The gospel does not change. And the divine word manifests itself and it will not be stopped. It will not be stopped. We have an example of a little miracle just today, just learned about this morning. Father Raphael in Colombia, <laughs> he was asked, his father mentioned the other day, he was asked, what about the new mass? Can we go to the new mass? 
And he didn't want to be involved in a conflict because he knew that Father Pfeiffer and Father Hugo, <coughs> Father Jacqueline and Father Godolo, and other Father Ruiz, other priests spoke out publicly and they were all punished and they were all ostracized within our little resistance. All of us thrown aside. He didn't want that to happen to himself. So he said, I don't want to be involved in politics. And they said, well, you must ask. We want to ask. Should we go to the new mass or not? So he wrote one little article, one small article, published in the Catholic Candle of the United States. He's in Colombia. He wrote one little article, and the article said, don't go to the new mass. It's not good for your soul. Someone gave the article to Bishop Thomas Aquinas and said, see, this is what Father Raphael said. And therefore, he sent word over to Colombia. This man should not be allowed to stay in the monastery because the monastery where Father Raphael was, the monastery was not owned by him but owned by the faithful. And so through the machinations of Bishop Williamson in the background, Father Bishop Thomas Aquinas, the new bishop, they threw him out. So said, you are thrown out. And so he was thrown into the streets. He found a place in Ecuador to go. So he went from Colombia to Ecuador with his two monks. I spoke with one of them this morning. He used to be one of our former seminarians. He went there to, 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 the, uh, to, to Ecuador. And what happened? When he arrived in Ecuador, having no place to go, it just so happened that our holy Pope Benedict, you may have heard of him, not Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, the humble Pope, the one that Bishop Fillet wants to make a deal with, the one that he says has a good heart, he knows the faith, he loves the faith, he's not an enemy of tradition. So says Bishop Fillet. He's a wise man. But nobody told that to 12 Benedictine sisters in Ecuador. They didn't know. 12 Benedictine sisters in Ecuador <laughs> were keeping their habits. And they were following the rule of St. Benedict. And the word came from Pope Francis. <coughs> Remember he wrote this about almost a year ago now, eight months ago. We have no place for Carmelite. We have no place for conservative. No place for contemplative orders in the Catholic Church today. You have to change your rule within one year. You have to get, adjust to Vatican II or be gone. And so in obedience to the holy lover of tradition named Pope Francis, the local bishop in Ecuador said to these 12 nuns, get out. You either remove your habits, you leave your rule, or you go in the streets. It just so happened that there was a priest who was expelled from Colombia, who had just arrived in Ecuador, who was saying the Latin Mass. And it was said this priest was a Benedictine monk. So they went to him and they said, What is your name, Father Raphael? Can you take care of us? Because we're being thrown out by the holy, humble, lover of tradition, Pope Francis. And we're being thrown out because we want to keep our old rule. And he said, Yes, I'll take care of you. So 12 nuns. And then 15 sisters, Franciscans in Colombia. They are also being told, get rid of your habits. Get rid of your the following of the old-fashioned rule. Or you are in the streets. And so now, Father, Father, because, and then it says during this time, these sisters also looked for a place to go. And this is all very recently. And during this time, I sent a letter to Bishop Thomas Aquinas which someone took and put upon the internet. They to Bishop Thomas Aquinas, but among other things, says, is not you, were not you responsible for cutting off Father Cardoso, telling people not to go to his mass and throwing him out of the house? Were not you responsible also for making sure that Father Raphael was thrown out of Colombia? And so they translated this into Spanish, sent the world around the Spanish world, and they're going to be a support of Father Raphael. And they began to work out things so that now Father Rafael was able just a few weeks ago to go back to Colombia. And now the 15 sisters of Franciscans have a place to go. The 12 Benedictine nuns, they are presently preparing to make themselves travel to Colombia where they will be near the monastery so that because of the actions, what is it that caused these 28 nuns, 27 nuns to have a place to go? We can look at it in two ways. One is the evil actions of others. That is, you said the new Mass is bad. If he didn't say the new Mass is bad, he wouldn't have been expelled from Colombia. If he wasn't expelled from Colombia, he wouldn't have been in Ecuador. If he wasn't in Ecuador, those 12 nuns would have no place to go. 
If it wasn't cleaned up again and made clear that there is a <coughs> there's some confusion, let's stand for the truth, he wouldn't have been able to go back to Colombia. And if he didn't go back to Colombia, the 15 sisters would have no place to go. So why does God allow wicked things to happen? St. Augustine tells us the reason why. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us the reason why. The only reason why God allows evil things to happen is for the chiseling of the good. And in fact, God shows himself through them, the evil actions of others. The evil cannot stop the good. Satan wanted to end the reign of Christ. What was his method? To crucify him. And Christ allowed himself to be crucified. What was the result? The conquering of the kingdom of Satan. Has God's way, have God's ways changed? They have not changed. So long as Father Hugo and I are condemned for teaching the truth, we are safe. We are perfectly safe. We cannot be harmed. So long as we continue to preach the faith, so long as we continue to stand by the gospel, so long as we continue to stand by our ancestors and not change, then we are perfectly safe and God will show himself. <coughs> throw out of one city, go to another. It says in the gospel. If they throw you out of one city, go to another. And so 2,000 years later, Father Raphael was thrown out of one city. What did he do? He went to another. And Christ was found there. And then he came back to the city in which he was thrown out. And Christ was found there also, but better than before. Just like Joseph. Joseph's brothers hated him. Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him. And they threw him away. And he was gone for many years. And when he came back, his brothers lived. And had he not been thrown away by his brothers, his brothers would have died of starvation. And the Jewish people would have ceased to exist. And God's promise to the Jews would not be fulfilled. But because one man, because the Holy Joseph of the Old Testament said no to sin, and he would not accept adultery and fornication. He would not accept to lie. He would not accept to disbelieve in his dreams. He was thrown into prison. He was accused of adultery. <coughs> he was sold into slavery. And what was the result? Egypt was saved. And Israel was saved. And all the nations around were saved because of Joseph. Because Joseph believed in the dreams. And we also must believe in dreams in our times. There is a sacred dream. When you look at the world today, you see it's ruled by Satan. You see evil all around. How can God rule in such a world? But open your eyes and see beyond the evil. Open your eyes and see to the other side. And you will see that God is here in 2017. As he has always been here. And he will always remain and he will always have his will fulfilled, and nothing shall block his will, and he shall show himself. And the most magnificent way that God shows himself is in little ways. Remember our Lord said in the Gospel of St. John, in his prayer, Lord, I thank thee that thou hast not revealed thyself to the wise. I thank thee that thou hast not revealed thyself to the proud, the gratitude of Christ. But thou hast revealed thyself to the humble, to the lowly ones. Where did Christ show himself in his own life? He went to a Samaritan woman at noontime. Father Urban Snyder used to point out many times when I was a little boy, old Trappist monk. He says, why was she at the well at noon? Because women go to the well in the morning. And they collect their water and they go home. I watched them do it in India. They go to the well in the morning. And they go to the well in the evening to get their water for the night. No one goes to the well at noon. But she went to the well at noon. Why? Because she was rejected by all the other women. She could not be in the presence of the other women because she had five husbands. <coughs> because she was wicked and despised. When did Christ show up at the well? He wasn't there in the morning when all the women were. He wasn't there in the evening when all the women were. He came in the noonday. And so that woman came at the noonday. And they had a sacred and holy conversation about God and His holy water. Whoever drinks of my water shall never taste thirst again. And if we drink of the water of our holy faith, we shall not thirst again. They can throw us in the desert, but we will find water. They can throw us anywhere they wish, but we will find water. We will not be abandoned. God will show Himself. And right now, another little miracle. 27 nuns, 27 sisters 
have now have a place of protection for Christ. Do they have food for tomorrow? No, but they have food today. And most likely there will be food tomorrow. God will find a way. When he fed the Jews in the desert, he only dropped enough manna on the ground for one day. That's all he did. And if we read the Holy Prayer, he taught us, the Our Father, he said, give us this day our daily bread. We don't need to store up the barn <coughs> for a long time. And remember what the Blessed Virgin Mary told St. Maximilian Colby. She was angry at him one time. He's always running out of money. And his superiors were always saying, you're building printing presses, you're sending stuff out, you don't have the money for it, have the money first. And so she, he complained to our lady. He said, Mary, my superiors are complaining. I must have the money first. And she said, have you ever eaten dinner? Said, yeah, a few times. Do you ever give another plate until the first one is empty? No, I guess not. Oh, how can I give you more? Unless you have spent all. Spend all, and then I can give you more. If you don't, why should I give you more? And so he spent more than he did before. The superiors are more unhappy. And so the economics of St. Maximilian Colby, this must be our economics. There are many economic plans, many economic policies, but the one of heaven doesn't match the manner of earth. Spend all, and God will give more. This is one reason, my friends, is he loves the poor. Because the poor recognize if you got $10, buy a candy bar, and let it all be gone. And tomorrow, I'll probably get another $10 and buy another candy bar. And they know somehow God will provide. But the wise men know economics. The wise men know the ways of the world. The wise men know the wisdom of the world. And this wisdom has no place in following Christ. Because God shows himself in the most magnificent ways. He shows himself in the small. He shows himself in the details. Where does he want us to be? <coughs> so many times it has happened. And it says in the gospel, Wherever I am, there my minister will be. It doesn't say where my minister is, there I will be. Many times the minister of God goes to a place, but he's not there. God is not there. Other times the minister of God goes to a place and he's there. Why? Because where God is, his minister will be. And so we have an example again here in Australia. Right next to the seminary. Right next to the seminary in Goldburn. One of the priests in the seminary told the, told the old man there, because you're in the resistance, you cannot be buried, said the rector on the seminary property. He had bought his, his, his funeral plot there. You cannot be buried here. No resistance priest will be allowed here. So they threw them off the burial place. They had to find another place to be buried. And if you are dying, said another priest, I will not come to anoint you. Five minute drive of heavy traffic. And there is some heavy traffic over there. Heavy traffic to the house. And so what happens? God arranges somehow that a priest from the other side of the world brings holy anointing. A priest from the other side of the world brings holy communion. And he will not be denied a Catholic burial. God will provide. Even if they come from the other ends of the earth. If we love God, if we serve God, if we believe in God, He will show Himself in the most magnificent and little ways. It's nothing for God to send a tsunami to wipe out all the sinners on earth. It's nothing to send a great earthquake, to send a war. This is nothing for him but to transform the heart of a wicked man, to convert a sinner, to make a soul turn from the love of the world to the love of him. This takes an infinite power and it goes on inside of our hearts and God shows himself and he will show himself and wherever he is, there his mother is. Wherever he is, there his holy church is. And we'll never find them separated. And also in the background, remember our protector is always the holy Joseph. He's here right now, St. Joseph. He's not saying a word. He's busy dreaming, taking a nap right now. But somehow from his dreams, somehow from his nap, there shall come a greater power that can come from all the nuclear bombs our enemies have and all their cyber controls. And all the things that Mr. Snowden warned about. All of their ways of sneaking about us and observing us and to tracking us. It only takes Joseph one nap, one dream, one word in sleep, and we shall be saved. And those three kings, this is when Christ entered them. He entered them in sleep. 
They saw Christ, they gave him gold, they gave him frankincense, they gave him myrrh. And then in sleep, God appeared to them and said, Go back. And it says in Latin, Per aliam viam. Per aliam viam. Go back through another way. Yes, go back to your country, but don't go back the way you came. Because whenever you meet Christ, you must walk away. It's at the end of the Mass. Ite Isaias. I remember one time the, the, the firemen were going to shut down our consecration of the church of St. Isidore in Denver. And about a thousand people coming to the consecration of the church. And the firemen said, you don't have any exit plan. You have no safety exit plan. I said, yeah, I do. We practice it every week. You ever been to Mass? <laughs> we have something in the Mass called Ite Misa Est. Try blocking the door. When we see Ite Misa Est, the people leave in 50 seconds and they exit the church. And if you're in the way, you're getting run over. We practice exiting the church in two seconds every single week. How often do you practice? And they just laughed. and said, okay, we, know, we have an exit plan. If there's a fire, we'll just say, Ite Misa so we have an exit plan. You take his eyes. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to go. You come to Mass, but you're supposed to leave. But you don't, You came in through one door, you leave through another. We came in through the door, sinners. We came in filled with the world. We came in with the worries of the world, the thoughts of the world, the ideas of the world. And when we go out, we go out another door. Maybe a window, that's fine too. More through a wall, but not the way you came in. And when we go out, we go out to bring souls to Christ. One day, St. Thomas, in one of his miracles, he was in his cave in India, where he was allowed to say Mass before. And he was saying, and it was not the day of his martyrdom. It was not the day for him to die. But the Hindus thought it was, and they came into the cave with a spear to kill him. He turned and saw them, and he went out the cave. There was only one entrance to the cave. But if you visit the cave now, you'll find there's two. There's the one that he, it was created at the flood and the one that Thomas created. And you can see the miracle of this day. Thomas reached up. There was a wall in the cave. He reached his left hand and he put it in the rock. And his fingers went into the rock. And you can place your fingers where Thomas put his fingers 2,000 years ago. He then put his other hand and he went straight through the rock. And the rock opened and he went out of the cave. Because it was not the day for him to die. And they did not get him. So if we are trapped without an exit, God will make one. He went through the cave. He went in one way, he came out another. And so it must be with us. Per aliam viam is the way that those magi went. And we must go per aliam viam. God's grace will not be stopped. Therefore we think, if I must have a bishop, no, I must have Christ. I must have a bishop, and in order to have a bishop, I have to keep my mouth shut. I have to stop preaching the truth. I have to stop condemning the errors. But remember, as long as I do that, everything will be okay. Why can't you fix your situation with a bishop? My duty is to fix my situation with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's my duty. My duty is to please Him, as Father LeBlanc, the old uh, French-Canadian priest, used to say all the time in Phoenix, I'm not here to please Him. I'm here to please Him. And then he would go through looking for some lady in pants where he could scream at him and throw him out of the church. Made it really feel good. And so the fact is that we are here to please God. That's what we're here for. And when we please Him, there's a really good chance things just might work out. He's had all eternity to think about my life. All eternity to think about when He would become man. And I don't know the next thing in the battle plan. I don't know the next thing in the schedule. But He knows. And that's good enough. Give us this day our daily bread. That's enough. And let us travel after our Lord Jesus Christ. And let Him show Himself in little ways. Let Him show Himself. Sometimes the plane is delayed. And there's someone that needs Christ. <coughs> Sometimes we're thrown out of one city. Because Christ wants to be in another city. And we come back to the city from which we came. And it's better when we were there the first time. And God will make sure that all things are well. To those that are of the household of the faith. To those that keep the faithful. And remember, let us remain faithful. And, and then God will make a, bring about the conversion. He can convert Pope Francis. He can convert Bishop Fillet. He can convert Bishop Williamson. He can convert the four bishops who have turned away from God, not following their fathers. He can convert any one of them. He can convert the wicked bishops and cardinals in Rome. 
They can convert all the bishops in the world. They can convert the priests. They can convert the highest Satanists. He can make the next pope a Rothschild. Pope Rothschild I, who might be the holiest pope that there's ever been. God can do what he wishes, and the devil cannot stop him. The devil cannot stop him, and he will never stop him. So have confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ, and how he shows himself in the most beautiful ways every day, from the time that he created this world until the time he comes back in power and majesty. Glory to bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>